Okay, now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Before I introduce uh, David personally, I'd like to uh, say a few things about Lenovo. Um, some of these facts you may not know. I don't mean Lenovo. I think it's worth talking about them a little bit because they are an incredible powerhouse in the industry, and and I think they embody a, a major inflection point that's occurring in, through in, in our industry. And what I mean by that is, just this year, 2014, we've seen IBM and HP uh, reintroduce themselves as cloud companies. And, and I think there's another, uh, that has another impact and it, or, or another meaning to that, which is also represents to, to me the handing of the baton, of the hardware baton, to companies like Lenovo. Um, and you're gonna see a lot more of them, obviously, uh, since the recent acquisition of, of IBM's X86 server business. So a, a, little, a little bit more about Lenovo. So they were, they were founded in the Orwellian year of 1984. Uh, and, and back then they were known as Legend. Uh, today they're a, a $40 billion company and they're a leader of, among many businesses they have, they're a leader on the client and the server side of computing. Uh, some examples of that are in 2005 they acquired the PC business of IBM. Today they're the world's number one supplier of PCs. Um, also on the client side, uh, they entered the mobile mobile computing uh, market in 2012. Um, today, they're uh, at least at some point this year they're number one smartphone supplier in China, and depending on which quarters, they're they're in the top five globally for smartphones. Um, and then on the uh, server side of computing, uh, as as I mentioned, in 2000 this year they acquired. The, uh, IBM's x86 server business, and prior to that, IBM was the number one uh, server vendor in the world if you combine all of their product lines together. But with the acquisition of the x86 line, uh, Lenovo is already today within striking distance uh, becoming number one uh, to join the number one position in, uh, on PCs. Um, so with that background, I'd like to also now I'd like to introduce our speaker. His name is David Isles. He's the director of product management, and, and I I also think it's worth noting that he has the dubious distinction of uh, working for three different companies with the same job in the last few years. I noticed on his LinkedIn profile that he was with Blade Networks, he was with IBM, and now he's with Lenovo, probably working on the exact same same product lines. Please uh, join me welcome David Isles. Introduction. In fact, you you stumped a bunch of my slides. Thanks. Uh, so actually, it gets a little better than just the last three jobs. I've been working with the same group of people probably the last five jobs. From startup to acquisition to startup to acquisition. Same group, right? Same engineers, same same folks. So I'll talk about. Well, I'm supposed to talk about cloud computing and software for my data centers, but mostly I'm going to talk about why the network isn't up this enough why you can't do cloud computing and software defined data centers. We'll skip through some of this. Um, so you mentioned, I'm David Isles. Uh, I have, uh, I'm kind of an industry networking veteran, having worked in Silicon Valley at Cisco, 3Com, Nortel, kind of did all the big vendors, and then a couple of startups, Altium Web Systems, Blade Network Technologies. So kind of done the, the big companies, small companies. So I've been working in networking quite a while, and now I'm responsible for networking Lenovo. And, and a very clever joke about Lenovo here. Kind of so uh, Lenovo is the number one maker of PCs, uh, partly because they continue the innovations and designs that uh, they bought from IBM, and partly because they've innovated themselves, or ourselves, um, in supply chain innovation. They are built for making hardware, and they do it better than almost anyone. And that's why one in five PCs bought today are supplied by Lenovo. Move on to uh, the acquisition. So Lenovo did make servers, and actually very good servers, and they're in some of the biggest hyperscale uh, accounts in China. Outside of China, though, the x86 server business from IBM has been equally successful uh, across the enterprise. And so recently, in the last month, uh, Lenovo bought the x86 server business. And part of that business was the network group that I'm part of. 
But part of that, too, is all of the, the designs for uh, servers, for x86-based servers. That includes SystemX, includes the Flex systems, embedded blade switches, blade servers. It also includes scale-up and scale-out servers, which I've got a couple of slides on later. It includes all of the skilled the people that have been used to building these highly uh, innovative designs, but now it's coupled with the guys that really like building hardware. And so we think that that's going to be a, a great combination. So let's talk more about servers and where they're deployed. So we get into the data center. So we see um, some new things going on in the data centers. Where it used to be many large enterprises would have 20 or more data centers, small data centers, each supporting a separate uh, business unit. We're seeing a lot of consolidation here. In fact, what we're seeing is, is larger data centers. In the, it was just a few years ago that we found out that in America, we were spending more electricity on servers than we were on television sets. So it's been a significant shifting point. <coughs> One of the things that we see in this consolidation of data centers is there's still the need to maintain this isolation, this multi-tenancy that says, even though I used to have 20 separate data centers, and now I have maybe two data centers, I still need to treat those mega data centers as if they were um, uh, 20 virtual small data centers or more. And in fact, there's a lot of economies of scale that get brought, and there's a lot of economic reasons for, for this consolidation. So one of the things that you get when you consolidate is you know, this economies of scale that I mentioned, a shared infrastructure cost. There's also this neat idea that says all my storage, all my data is in one place. So now I can bring the power of big data analytics to that storage. I can make correlations of that data. I can learn more about my own business and make better business decisions. But in order to pull that off, in order to have a consolidated data center, there's this idea of cloud computing. And this is an idea that says I'm going to uh, take a large data center and virtualize it. I'm going to carve it up. I'm going to pretend like it's multiple data centers. I'm going to provide security for each tenant to another. It's also very similar to what's being done on the public side of this data center equation. So there's all of this, this new requirements for the data center. And so part of this is the requirements to change quickly, to adapt, to be self-provisioning, um, self-automated, um, uh, and programmable. So these are key new requirements that really haven't been around before. And so to be honest, if you look at the servers, servers got this figured out way before networking. If you look at how long it takes to provision a server, even if you aren't virtualizing it, you've got Pixie, the server can come up in really minutes. It can boot on land. And then now that we've virtualized the hardware in the server, I can turn up hundreds of virtual machines in probably you know, five minutes. Now you turn that around and say, well, now that I turn on these new workloads, I would like to do the same thing for my network. Well, in most data centers, that's a problem. I need to have a, a, a Cisco-trained CLI expert with a PhD in iOS XYZ. Right? So those guys have to be able to figure out how to configure these things. And, and it's usually more than just the network configuration. It's the firewall rules that have to be pre-tested ahead of time and scheduled. So usually it's a two-week turnaround for the network and a five-minute turnaround for the, uh, the server piece. So there's a lot that the networking guys can learn from the server guys. Because again, you guys have, have kind of figured this out. In fact, there's a, when we look at, at um, surveys of people that actually use uh, networks and use data centers, IBC provided uh, a survey and they asked them, so what are you doing, what is your network doing well and what is it not doing well? And so if you looked, and some of you can't really read this probably from here, but the big things were it's, it's, it's slow to change. It requires manual intervention. It doesn't um, uh, scale up well. It doesn't um, uh, provide security very well. So these are all things that, if you look, they are addressed by software-defined networking. So this is promise of software-defined networking that is key to this bigger picture of the software-defined data center. You might be asking, so what is this software-defined data center? So this, this promise that says, you know, rather than having um, these two-week-long work orders, instead what we'd like to have is a web portal, a website that either internally to an organization or externally for a public cloud, you can go to a website. And with a few clicks of a button, you can reserve, a, say, a web server and an FTP server. And along with just a few clicks, you can say, I want one CPU core for the web server two or three for the database server. 
This is the amount of memory. These are the bandwidth requirements. Oh, hey, I might want data deduplication services or uh, any kind of backup services. And yep, I'll pay for some firewall services. And I like maybe even a private network that connects these two webs, these two services together, so that they can talk to each other as if they're in the same network, regardless of maybe where they are physically in the, in the data center. So that's the promise of this this automated idea that I click a few things and then I press a buy now, or I put in a, my own organizational code or PO number. And then behind the scenes, a program goes out there and automatically provisions everything, from the firewall rules to the storage to the networking, and, and it's all done without having some trained CLI person go and configure anything. It's done through a, a program. And there's need to be a programming API for all of these things. And so there's a number of methods for doing this. And so uh, the simplest method is open APIs, where if you're a small data center, you've only got a few thousand VLANs you have to worry about. Well, you could do that. You could say, you know what, I've got a script. And actually, the largest data centers that we've worked with in the last decade, they don't let network admins configure anything. Right? They have a script, and someone clicks, and that provisions the, the, the network. Because fat fingers cause data center outages. And no one wants to be responsible for the New York Stock Exchange going down. Right? So everyone for quite a long time has figured out, I need to use programs to configure my data center. But that doesn't really scale when it comes to cloud environments. And so there's other methods that have been talked about. One is this idea of open flow. And this is an idea of working. It's a construct that says, I'm going to change everything I know about networking. I'm going to take all you know, 20 years of experience and 5,000 RFCs and throw them out the window. And instead, I'm going to take the control plane and the data plane and completely separate them. And that, that may actually take off at some point. But for right now, that seems like it's um, kind of contained in, in certain very specific use cases. But for the larger data center environments, we're seeing a new software-defined networking become prevalent. And that is this concept of overlays. So if you were to think about what is an overlay, there's a lot of parallels to um, the virtualization of server hardware. Right? With the server hardware, what I do is I have the physical hardware, and then I've got a hypervisor layer. And above that hypervisor layer, I can install multiple virtual servers, the virtual machines. And every one of those virtual machines thinks they're talking to the regular physical underpinnings. And I can have hundreds of virtual machines in like a VDI implementation. Well, the network with overlays is kind of the same thing. It says, I'm going to have a hypervisor layer for the physical network. And now, instead of having one network, I can have thousands, or actually with VXLAN, literally millions of virtual networks that run on top of this physical infrastructure. The parallels are very, very similar. And the beauty of this is that I can then, on the underlying, the underlay, as many of them call it, the regular physical network, I can use those thousands of RFCs that I already know how to deploy. I know how to troubleshoot. I know how to monitor, and all of my guys are already trained on. And by the way, it's nice and stable and predictable. And then for the dynamic things that need to change every time I put on a new workload or a new business objectives change, those things can be dynamic and done in this overlay layer. So this is kind of this new way as we see it of doing um, software fine networking. And as we see this change where we're moving a lot of the value from the embedded hardware where before I used to have, to have all the multi-tenancy features, all the security features provided by the network operating system that's on that switch. And most of it's moving up now into this overlay layer. Well, that, that actually introduces a new concept. Well, new for networking. And there's this idea of open networking. And this is a disaggregated model that says, just like servers used to, used to go to one vendor and they would provide everything in a server. It would be the, the hardware, the CPU, the keyboards, uh, everything was provided by one vendor. And at some point, people started buying Linux and Unix, and they bought the operating system from one company and the hardware from another company. And the whole industry benefited. And so too, there's a lot of parallels with networking. It, up until recently, you know, just a few years ago, if you wanted to be in the networking business, you pretty much had to do everything yourself. You had to have ASIC developers. right? You had to have people that knew how to build hardware, sheet metal, the network operating system. And so you had homegrown silicon. Nowadays, though, that's that middle column. Today's switch, most people use merchant silicon. 
So you can get a 48 port ending switch from Cisco, Juniper, Lenovo, and they all use the exact same silicon, same CPU, and really the only differentiation is in the brand on the outside of the box and the software, the network operating system. That's the true differentiation in today's um, switches. And if you get a torque screwdriver, you can usually open up and, and see for yourself. What could be happening in the future is this thing on the right, which is a disaggregator approach that says maybe we don't need to get the hardware from the same place that we get the network operating system. And maybe even some of the higher value pieces can be provided by someone else as well. See, today in the middle, if you want uh, a regular switch that just does solid layer three, chances are you also have to pay for their MPLS development that you don't care about. And you have to get their advanced spanning tree protocols, which maybe you don't care about, and a host of other things that are kind of packaged into that. And so, as we see it, there's a future out there that may disaggregate these things. We're not there today. The, the guys that make uh, these different parts, there's kind of a, a something that we're seeing that may be enabled by software defined networking. Today, though, if you wanted to see what you could build with, with what we actually sell today, that's what we get here on, on this slide here. Today, if you wanted to build a software defined network that was cloud ready, we've got a number of special features that enable that, right? We've got OpenFlow. So we do support OpenFlow. We were one of the first to offer it on a, on a production switch. We had our own controller. Big investors in OpenFlow. We also invest in a lot of monitoring tools that help out these uh, software-defined environments, S-Flow, microburst detection. And then we, just like you can net boot a, a server, have a pixie boot, all of our switches you can do the same thing, kind of a zero-touch provision. You turn it on, and it just boots it, gets its configuration from the network. So these are all kind of building blocks to a uh, software-defined environment. So if we were to go through the simple steps, how would I build a software-defined environment? Well, so you can start with regular switches. You don't need anything special necessarily to run an overlay. That's the idea is that you, you can use your existing investment and install overlay technology on there day one. Over time, you can start adding SDN-ready switches. So these are switches that can participate in the overlay better than the current switches. So as I mentioned, you can run overlays over the current switches, but they're kind of unaware of what's going on. If you have switches that are aware of what's going on in the overlay, they can load balance traffic across um, link aggregation groups or layer three ECMP groups. You get better entropy right, for, for that kind of traffic if you're aware of, the, of the, the overlay traffic. You can also do other neat things like pretend to be a vSwitch and take care of the um, gateway between the physical network and the logical network. Some great use cases for that would be, let's say you've got a bunch of storage or security devices that are not aware of the overlay, but you like to connect them to this virtual network. That's where you want this SDN red uh, switches. And then the other thing you want is this concept of managing them both in one tier. So wherever you're doing your, your overlays, you like that same orchestration tool, that same dashboard, if you will, to be able to monitor the health of your network. So you can see at a glance, hey, how is my network doing? Because they already know how your servers are doing. They know maybe how your firewalls are doing, your storage are doing. You really need to have good diagnostics at the, for the v-admin to be able to access. So we drilled down a little bit further. IBM did an analysis of kind of what kind of savings you can get if you did virtualize your network. And so you can expect deployment times are going to plummet. We know that. Uh, but um, provision times, that means when you want to re-add new things. Labor costs go down, because again, it's automated. And then it pays, it pays itself back very, very quickly. So great return on investment. But there's also a kind of a benefit to the data flow. So one of the neat things about overlay, so I'm going to show here, this is, this is showing um, uh, one of the things that comes with the VMware's NSX. But there's similar technologies from other overlay solutions. But one of the things, if you think about a data center, it's a cloud-based data center. I may have a couple of virtual machines, and the network doesn't necessarily know if they're allowed to talk to each other. In fact, what you want to do is, is only allow traffic that's been authorized to talk to each other. So if I have two different virtual machines in a normal, non-virtualized data center, and those virtual machines want to talk to each other, that traffic has to get forwarded up multiple tiers of the network. It's got to go through the access layer, up to the aggregation layer, all the way up to what's 
usually called the service layer of, or service tier of the data center. And that's where your load balancers are. It's also where your firewalls are. And those are usually very large, expensive firewalls that handle most of your east-west traffic. And you end up with this kind of tromboning effect. The traffic that is from one virtual machine that may be sitting right next to another virtual machine is forced to go up these many tiers of the network, up to the firewall. Then the firewall decides, yes, they're allowed to talk, and then the traffic goes back down. Well, with an overlay technology, they can put a lot of the firewall rules right into the fee switch itself. And that allows then, in, in some cases, if the two virtual machines in question are on the same physical server, well, then there could be zero network calls, right? It could, it could be one um, virtual switch hop, so virtual network hop. So big, big advantages there. So if you can imagine the amount of bandwidth that was wasted on the left versus the right, big benefits there. But if you take it one step further and say, well, what if, what if those virtual machines are really on the same server, right? Because I have thousands of servers. Well, in this case, we think we've got some advantages here versus the competition. A typical FEX architecture where you have no local switching forces traffic again to trombone up the network and then back down. And on the right, you see with our localized switching, where we push switching as close as possible to the edge of the network, it optimizes that east-west traffic flow, and so, which is the fastest growing um, type of traffic in today's data centers, where servers are talking more to other servers than they are to clients. So part of what we do to make this work, we've got this new flex system interconnect fabric. And so we've, we've got, we make the switches that go inside of the Lenovo's Blade um, server enclosures. And what we've done is we've taken uh, this idea of a server pod. It says if you've got two, two chassis or up to nine chassis, you can combine them all and put them in one big fabric. And that means, what does that mean? So that means instead of having 20 devices to manage in terms of network devices, each with their own IP address and their own config file, you now have one virtual network device. And you can put it in a mode that says, you know what, instead of looking like a bunch of network devices to the upstream network, you can take this whole pod and make it look like a big server to the upstream network. So as far as the upstream network is concerned, it's one big server with an LACP, a single um, lag um, pointing to it. And you don't have to, if you're a server admin, you don't necessarily have to be worried about um, spanning tree configurations or what VLANs are configured there. Uh, there's a mode where you can just add cables and it's gonna work. And so this is one of the kind of the newest things that we have for this embedded uh, switch technology. So other things, part of this portfolio, as um, we look at, at the System X business coming over to Lenovo, I mentioned early on that we make a lot of different kinds of servers now. We make high-end servers, so scale-up servers. This includes X6, which we've got a slide on next. Uh, we also have dense systems, so these cases where you want to build a high-performance computing and you need as many cores as possible per rack. This is one of those very, very dense uh, systems that even offers uh, water cooling. And not even, you know, they've got some pretty neat innovations around warm water cooling. So you don't need a chiller to pull this off. Um, pretty, pretty neat stuff, and they're, they're actually demonstrating most of the stuff at Super next, next week. Uh, I mentioned blades. So blade, uh, blade servers, blade server switches, those all come over. They're part of their own business. And of course, lots of traditional 1U to you servers. And then part of that, again, is networking. So all of the networking came over here. All right, so I'm going to do one obligatory server slide, because this is a server show. And one of the neat things that I saw about this new X6 uh, server that the System X group had is they have this, this idea of bringing agility to a server platform. And if you think about most servers, I can get them with a certain number of CPU slots or um, cores. Uh, and, and they're populated, and, and that's pretty much what I get. And if I want to expand it, sometimes yeah, I can add another CPU to it. But this has the concept that they've introduced of a CPU book, right? That says, you know what? On a rail, I'm going to have CPU, memory, and a couple of hot swappable fans, and I can uh, slide that in and out. And then, and over time, I can put another generation of Intel uh, processor without changing the whole server, and I can scale up as I need. So. Uh, you can have, uh, I think, up to eight of these trays uh, per server. 
So you can start off with two or three or four, and then when Intel comes out with their next refresh cycle, well, you don't have to throw away the server or even recable the power of the, the networking. You can slide out these um, server uh, compute books and uh, scale over time. So that's one of the innovative areas that we've got in terms of uh, servers. So to kind of wrap up here, we're talking about data centers, we're talking about cloud and software defined network. So it just again to recap, there's this idea of open APIs, open flow, and overlays. And the latest kind of neat way of carving up your data center and putting a hypervisor layer over your network is overlays. Overlays uh, primarily today in the enterprise from VMware with their NSX technology. But there's also open uh, versions as well, and Microsoft has their own overlay technology as well. They're all really meant to virtualize your data center. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. There's a slide there on, um, if you guys get the slides, on where you can get more information. Uh, there's links to the Lenovo site, and uh, you might check out the, the networking portion. That's it. Thanks, guys.